tonight. Um, how to make $5,000 per month wholesaling real estate. What we're going to be breaking down exactly in this lesson is what is wholesaling real estate? The overview of the process in regards to wholesaling real estate. Why would someone sell to a wholesaler? And then finally, real life examples. And we're going to reverse engineer the goal. And then for the Cashflow Tribe Alpha members that are watching this on Easy Webinar, I'm also I have also got some homework and next steps for you guys as well. Okay, let's just move on and get into it. So, what exactly is wholesaling real estate? Well, you guys have probably seen the like "We Buy Houses" signs. You know, maybe you've gotten the handwritten letters in your mail. Maybe you've just watched some YouTube videos about people breaking down wholesaling real estate. But I find that there's still a lot of confusion around the topic matter. So that's what we're going to be kind of covering tonight before we even really get into anything else. So here's the process for wholesaling real estate. A wholesaler is going to find a value add or underutilized property. So a value add property could be, you know, a property that's been neglected for a few years, maybe a few decades, maybe even longer sometimes, at least when we're looking at properties. Um, so oftentimes, you know, if we can clear out the junk, if we can get the property back to its former uh, glory or, you know, improve it even more so, we can actually add a lot of value to it. Um, or alternatively, maybe it's underutilized property. Maybe it could be subdivided into multiple units. Maybe, you know, it's not being used to its highest, best, most efficient use. Um, so then the wholesaler, once they find that initial opportunity, they're going to enter into an assignable purchase and sale agreement with the seller. Here in Ontario, Canada, unless the contract states otherwise, every contract's assignable. So usually for wholesalers in Ontario, Canada, we're still going to add on our Schedule A an assignment clause. But technically, you don't even have to if you want to assign the property, but it will make it uh, a lot smoother with every with all the parties involved, as well as the lawyers, if you can, in fact, put that assignment clause in the Schedule A at the end of your purchase and sale agreement. Um, then they market the property to potential buyers. So, you know, some wholesalers build up email lists, some have private Facebook groups, some just go to networking events and talk to fellow real estate investors. Then finally, they're going to fill out an assignment and sale agreement to a buyer. Often it's going to be an investor who pays a fee for the contract. So in essence, you know, think of wholesaling real estate as flipping paper or flipping contracts. The wholesaler never takes ownership of the property, but assigns the purchase and sale agreement before closing. So it's actually quite a simple process when you think about it. You know, people flip cars, people flip houses. This is just flipping paper. That's all wholesaling real estate is. It's a... Uh, it's literally just that simple. So moving on, this is what the actual wholesaling process looks like. So when we talk about lead generation, finding those off market properties or those properties that maybe are being neglected on the MLS, there's a lot of different approaches wholesalers use. And realistically, you're going to have to fine tune your approach based upon your market. So we find that, you know, each market's unique and each like city or municipality that we're targeting for wholesaling real estate, you know, it, it really will have its own um, best practices. But as a wholesaler, we're just going to have to experiment to really dial in what works best. Here in my market in southwestern Ontario, you know, we really love driving for dollars. Um, we love doing networking events. And then we really also get a lot of value from uh, flyer campaigns. But the whole spectrum of different lead generation options are driving for dollars. So this is where you may literally just drive up and down the street looking for distressed properties, properties that have been neglected. Often some of the best ways to notice that is like long grass or tarps on the roof or broken down cars in the driveway or, you know, maybe the windows look really old and dated. Maybe, you know, we can see the brickwork is starting or the mortar is starting to separate on the brickwork. Maybe the siding starting to fall off the house. Uh, maybe the screen door is broken. We're really just looking for properties that look like they're being neglected. They haven't been brought up to their highest best use. And in the 21st century, we can also just go Google Street View for dollars. And this is actually one of my favorite ways to save time. And you're going to save your gas money as well. So you can actually just go on Street View in Google and you can just go up and down the street and look at different properties. And what's fantastic that a lot of people don't realize about Google Street View is we can actually go back in time too. So I think in London, like you can look at like 2016, 2017, like 2019 on Google Street View. So we can even see and get a, an initial understanding of how long has this property been neglected? The longer it's been neglected, potentially the greater the chance of an opportunity there. Um, alternatively, you can literally just walk up and down the street, knock on doors, chat with neighbors, talk to people on their front porches and get a better feel for what's going on in that specific little neighborhood. 
Uh, one little pro tip is when we're knocking for dollars or driving for dollars, we often like to look for what we call the mayor. And so the mayor is someone that's they're likely saying on their front porch, maybe they're having a beer, maybe they're having a coffee or a tea, but the mayor knows everyone's business. So they're very dialed into what's going on on their block. And they can often give us a lot of insider information that's going to help us better understand, you know, potentially um, some of the distressed properties on that street. And usually we find the mayor is more than happy to let us know what's going on. So this is obviously not like the literal mayor of that municipality or city. This is just someone that's they're a nosy neighbor. Uh, secondly, you can do bandit signs. So bandit signs, you know, sometimes you see them stapled on telephone poles. Sometimes you see them just stuck in the ground, you know, those little poly bags with a uh, metal frame. Now, the reason they're called bandit signs is often they're not allowed in your local municipality or city. So you guys are going to have to check your bylaws and you're going to have to figure out whether you want to be on the right or wrong side of your bylaws. Personally, we have experimented with bandit signs in the past, but here in Southwestern Ontario, we do not drive a lot of our business from bandit signs. So because they're not really on the right side of the bylaw officers and they don't really generate a lot of value for us, we've kind of pushed bandit signs to the side. But in your market, if, especially if bandit signs currently aren't being used, it may be a great opportunity. So that's something you may want to look into. Flyers. So these can be the handwritten flyers that you see that say, you know, we buy houses, we pay cash, we close fast, things of that nature. Or it can be like a typed up more professional flyer. And maybe it's got a photo of you or your family or your office. If you're really doing wholesaling on a large scale, um, really, again, you're just going to want to A, B test the different approaches in regards to lead generation. Then we've got like websites or search engine optimization. So maybe you want to build a brand around your wholesaling business and, you know, set up a website and try and really bring inbound traffic when people are typing into Google, you know, sell my house fast London, Ontario. Again, we've experimented with that to a small degree, but we've never really found a lot of value in um, implementing that approach. Then there's uh, Google AdWords and Facebook ads. I know some wholesalers that are absolutely crushing it using Google AdWords and Facebook ads. And I also know some wholesalers that are spending a lot of money and not getting results. So again, there's no one perfect strategy here as far as lead generation is concerned, but there is a lot of different opportunities. Even some of the larger wholesalers these days are literally starting to do radio or TV campaign ads. Now that definitely comes with a higher sticker price, but if you've got the money to invest, that may be a great approach for you because a lot of your competition won't either have the resources or won't have the confidence to deploy their resources into that lead generation strategy. Then things like billboards as well, but then if you guys don't have a lot of money to get started on your lead generation, just scrape Kijiji and Facebook Marketplace. A lot of sellers for a multitude of reasons decide that they wanna sell privately. They don't wanna list their property on realtor.ca or on the MLS. So they just post a you know, uh, for sale by owner ad on Kijiji, on Craigslist, on Facebook Marketplace, or really wherever else people sell houses. And we found some of our best opportunities there, especially when I was first getting into real estate investing um, or getting into wholesaling real estate back in 2016, 2017 here in London, Ontario, the Kijiji and Facebook was not saturated. There was myself and one other person in London, Ontario posting, we buy houses, we clo close fast, we pay cash uh, to buy your house. So at that time, that was a great opportunity for me to find motivated sellers. Now it's very much saturated in my market, but again, depending on what's going on in your local market, all you need to do is some basic research to dial in whether that could be a great lead source. Uh, then you can also literally find opportunities on the MLS or realtor.ca. Now in general, in my opinion, in order to get a deal on the MLS or realtor.ca, you're likely going to need to um, you know, really get good at negotiating, really be dialed into what's going on in your market, but this can absolutely be done. And right now, I know a lot of Canadians have a limiting belief, especially those in Ontario, Canada, that that can't be done in 2020 in Ontario because it's such a hot real estate market. Well, I wanted to spell that myth right away because myself, Matt McKeever, I've already wholesaled the deal here in 2020. Um, it was a unique property on the MLS had been sitting for a while. I negotiated a really unique set of terms with the seller. And then I was interested in buying the property myself, but another person in my network was more interested and they were willing to pay me an assignment fee in order to get the right to that contract. So again, any of these strategies can work. It's really just going to depend upon exactly how you want to build your wholesaling business. And then finally, 
you can also just look for for sale by owner ads and we can also look on things like you know comfrey or what's now called purple bricks or any of those other property guys is another one here in canada um any of those websites that allow sellers to post their properties for sale by themselves rather than going through the traditional channel of using a realtor for anyone that's currently watching this on facebook or on youtube or on easy webinar just want to let you guys know i'm going to go through the lesson here first it's going to take about 45 minutes but then at the end i'll have a 15 minute q a where i'll just jump into any and all of your questions again i'm very sorry to the youtube listeners and the facebook listeners that had dead audio for the first five or 10 minutes of this webinar. Um, then finally, once we've got the lead generation, once we're starting to talk to an interested and motivated seller, now it's time to actually negotiate. And a lot of investors, especially a lot of novice or beginner investors, they make the mistake of not, not focusing on the seller's perspective. They're really just focused on trying to beat up the seller, get the lowest price possible. And that, that's not how this game actually works. Uh, in order to become a successful wholesaler, to be able to do this at scale, you're going to have to get really good at understanding people and being able to learn the sellers why and create win-win opportunities because the sellers do have options. They can always go to a realtor. They can always go to realtor.ca or the MLS and get their property listed. So the way that we're going to overcome that is by really dialing in and understanding what they're trying to accomplish by selling their property. Then once we've negotiated with them, we can uh, we need to contract or tie up the property. So that's where we're going to complete our assignable purchase and sale agreement. Reminder, if you're doing this in Ontario, Canada, um, unless the contract states otherwise, it is assignable. But in general, just to make your life easier, we, we do recommend having an assignment clause in the purchase and sale agreement. It, it's just going to make your lawyer, their lawyer, and everyone's just lawyer much more happier with the process. It's just going to make it smoother for everyone. But even if you forgot to put in the assignment clause, don't panic. Unless there's something saying you specifically can't, you can absolutely do this. Then once we've, con once we've got the property under contract, now it's time to market the property to our potential buyers. So again, a lot of wholesalers will bu build up a buyer's list. Maybe that looks like an email list. Maybe that's a private Facebook group, or maybe that's just going and networking at your local REI, your real estate investor uh, meetup group. Then once we've started marketing it, if we've got an interested buyer, if we've got someone that wants to buy the contract off of us, now it's time to complete the assignment of the property. So we're going to just do the assignment paperwork. And so we're going to assign to that uh, new buyer. Then finally, at the time of closing, that's when we, the wholesaler, that's when we're going to get paid. So we're going to collect a, an assignment fee at the time of uh, the new buyer closing on the property. So we've never taken ownership of the property. All we did was we had a interest in the property, which was our paper contract. We decided instead of buying the property and closing on it ourselves to assign it to another investor that was more interested in buying it off of us. And they're willing to pay us an assignment fee. Does that make sense, guys? I hope that makes sense. All right. So then moving on, why would someone ever want to sell to a wholesaler? And this is a question I get a lot. This is uh, one of the reasons I think that wholesalers are misunderstood is the general public or people that aren't in a motivated seller or a private seller's shoes don't really understand why someone would ever want to use a wholesaler because they think that you will always get top dollar on the MLS and you'll always get top terms on the MLS. The biggest issue here is there's really more to selling a property than just the price. So there's the price and the terms. And as a real estate investor, as a sophisticated real estate investor, you should really understand that there's a lot of value in understanding that the deals are often created in the terms, not just the loan and the price. So a lot of beginner wholesalers only focus on trying to get the absolute lowest price and they come off aggressive to the seller and they try and beat them up. This is a mistake because we're not really trying to create a win-win with the seller. We need to get dialed into what their, what their why is. So why would someone ever want to sell to a wholesaler? Well, like I was saying, money isn't always the number one motivator. Many do not want their property on the MLS for a variety of reasons. So one, sometimes they want to sell really fast. Maybe they got a job transfer, which is quite common, or at least we seem to come across it quite often here in Ontario, where someone's got a job transfer out to you know, Alberta or to BC, and they've got a week or two to tie up their personal affairs. They've got a really good opportunity. 
Um, sometimes the person's losing the property to foreclosure. So a bank's going to step in and take the property because they haven't been making their payments or they haven't been paying their property taxes or there's some other sort of uh, neglect that the seller has been doing. And all of a sudden now they've realized that they've hit an inflection point where if they don't act fast, they're literally going to lose their entire interest in the property. So they'd rather sell to a wholesaler um, who will be able to pay cash or that has a buyer that will pay cash and close very fast on the deal. And sometimes there's also just major life changes. So again, like maybe they've realized like, you know, maybe they're going through like death, divorce or some other major catalyst in their life. And it's really creating an inflection point where they've decided they just want to walk away from their old life. They want to walk away from the clutter in their life. And selling fast is one of their primary objectives. Um, another big one for us is illegal use of property. So often we find and we buy properties off of sellers that the property doesn't conform to existing zoning. So maybe the seller at some point in time or a previous owner of the property converted a single family uh, house in a neighborhood that's only allowing uh, single family residences into a duplex, a triplex or a fourplex. And they're currently operating it as such. Well, they don't want to put it on Realtor.ca or the MLS and have it go under a microscope. And they're afraid of having, you know, the bylaw officer called on them. They're afraid of having the city step in and slap them on the wrist. Well, us as, you know, more sophisticated investors, we often know how to solve that problem. Maybe we understand how to get a, uh, maybe we understand how to, you know, uh, get an exception to the zoning. Maybe we understand how to, you know, convert the property back into its former use or into a legal use. And that's going to be part of our strategy. So because we have this greater understanding of the overall real estate process, we're able to step in and really uh, solve that problem for the seller. And the seller is able to sell the property without having to, you know, learn and understand the entire zoning process or, you know, the entire application process for a change of use, things of that nature. Uh, another big one is privacy. So maybe they're a hoarder, maybe they have a unique collection that they don't want other people to see, or maybe they've got like a quirky hobby. And again, they don't want people to see how they live. So we often are dealing with hoarders, people that have just accumulated a lot of stuff or people that struggle to let go of anything out of their lives. Sometimes we're walking through properties where there's literally just a path to the kitchen, just a path to the bedroom, just a path to the bathroom. And that's it. All the rest is just filled with junk. And sometimes people all of a sudden come to an awakening moment where they decide, you know what? I just want to let go of all this shit. I just want to move on. And again, there's often a misunderstanding here that this must be, you know, someone that's in absolute dire straits. Sometimes it is, but often it isn't. So I can think of one example where there was a really well-respected member of the community. Um, they were a judge and they actually had like, their principal residence, but then they had a second house where they kept like over 30 cats. And because they're a well-respected member of the community, they don't want other people to see and know how they live. So they decide alternatively just to sell the property privately, quietly, because if they were to put it on realtor.ca or the MLS, someone might realize, you know, how they live or how they're operating that property. And they're afraid of judgment or criticism or potentially it having them impact their lives. We've also walked through properties where, you know, someone's got like a bong collection and they've got hundreds of bongs um, or they've got, you know, just something quirky. Maybe they're into some really quirky anime stuff and they don't want the general public to see uh, their personal collection. Or maybe they have a really valuable collection of something. And again, they don't want the general public coming through and realizing that they've got a million dollars in watches or they've got a million dollars in Lego or some other uh, collection. And again, they just want that privacy factor. So they've decided alternatively to sell to a wholesaler who's going to come in, just tie up the property. They're either going to buy the property themselves or they may assign it to someone else. And again, they just want a, a smooth process where they're not going to be put under the limelight or the spotlight. Um, alternatively, sometimes we find sellers that want really unique terms. So one example I can think off of the top on a recent deal we did, a person or a couple came into a really large inheritance and they were in the process of building their dream home. Once their dream home's completed, they wanted just to let go of their existing house because they just wanted to move into the dream home and move on with their life. 
and they didn't know when the project would be done. Very common with new build construction that there's delays, that there's complications, things of that nature. So alternatively, what they want to do was have a rolling closing date. This is something that's really hard to negotiate on the MLS or realtor.ca. And oftentimes a realtor, for whatever reason, will not be nearly as understanding as a wholesaler and won't be willing to write into the contract a role in closing date. Where us as wholesalers, problems are profits. That's one of the reasons that it's a uh, one of my most popular slogans and a phrase that me and my team live by. So we'll be like, yeah, no problem. We'll do a role in closing date at some point in the next six months. You'll sell the property to us, you'll move out, and uh, we'll take over ownership. Alternatively, some sellers want a vendor take back mortgage, particularly here in Canada. There's there can be particularly here in Canada, there can be massive uh, tax consequences with large capital gains where we can actually defer them over a period of five years, depending on how we set up that vendor take back. And that can allow them to smooth the tax obligation or in fact, even reduce the overall taxes they pay just depending on their exact living situation and what income tax bracket they're in and what their active income is and things of that nature. Um, alternatively, sometimes we find unique terms like the seller wants to, one of their children lives in the property and they want to make sure that that child can continue to live in the property for a year without being disrupted. And so again, as wholesalers, we're really focused on understanding that seller's why, crafting a contract that fits within their needs that's still going to work for us as the investor or potentially work for one of the investors on our list. And we're going to really dial in that win-win opportunity with the seller through our negotiation process. Um, as well, sometimes there's complicated properties. And so we find ourselves frequently dealing with complicated properties. So maybe there's like a rights or use issue. So maybe like Bell or the city or Rogers has some sort of uh, right of way on the property, which makes it a little bit complicated or makes the use a little bit more unique um, oftentimes we're buying properties with like quirky solar contracts. So a few years ago, it was really popular for people to be going door to door selling solar contracts. And some of those solar contracts were really constructed in a way that if not being predatory was right on the line of being predatory and makes the property very difficult to sell because, uh, the solar company really like owns your roof essentially. And, uh, if the roof's in bad repair, it can actually be really costly to uh you know be able to replace the roof and so oftentimes again the seller may not fully understand how to navigate that because it can be quite complicated and so again us as more sophisticated investors we're willing to really dive in do the due diligence and get a firm understanding of how we can navigate these complicated rental contracts sometimes there there's restrictions on the property or building so again maybe the city's flagged it maybe the city's tagged it because of it is an illegal use and the city's found out and all of a sudden now the sellers should stress and they just want to walk away because they're sick of the problem they're sick of all the issues and hassles that they've been dealing with on that property um then also again sometimes properties are in really bad repair and so they're not mortgageable or they're at least not mortgageable by a traditional lender and again we find oftentimes realtors are pushy or pressuring their clients or their potential clients into well you have to fix up this property before you list it you have to clear out the junk you have to do this out of the other and they're not actually really listening to the sellers why and so again us as wholesalers we're able to craft that win-win opportunity with the seller by just listening to them understanding their why and then figuring out if there's a way that we can build a contract around that that's going to still work for us as an investor and work for them as the seller also, sometimes people just want convenience. They want an easy sale process. They don't want to have a bunch of strangers coming in and out of their property. They don't want to have to worry about a ton of showings. They just want to sell it and they just want to make life as simple as possible. Um, as well, sometimes, you know, properties have been listed on the MLS and for whatever reason they didn't sell. Oftentimes we find it's because of lack of proper marketing, a lack of proper sales effort. And so us as a wholesaler, we can step in because we see the opportunity. We see past the, the poor photos. We see past the neglect on the property. And we can see that those bones are solid, that there really is a great opportunity there. Or maybe the property has just been sitting on MLS for a really long time. And the seller's getting fatigued and tired with the fact that their property is not selling. Even in Ontario in 2020, in this crazy hot market, 
This is absolutely doable. And again, reminder, I've already done that myself and assigned a property here in 2020 that was on the MLS that had just been sitting there for a long time. Is this making sense? Are you guys understanding a little bit more behind the seller's why now? Um, oftentimes when we get into the subject matter, again, I find people are a little, you know, they're quick to judgment. Like, oh, well, like, why wouldn't the seller just figure out the zoning issue? Why wouldn't the seller do this out of the other? It's the exact same thing as why I pay a lawyer a lot of money per hour to do a contract. It's the same reason that people pay a CPA or a chartered accountant a lot of money to do their taxes. We don't have the expertise. We don't have the knowledge. We don't have the foresight or we don't see the full opportunity there. It all comes back to information asymmetry, in my opinion. That's really where all opportunities lie. And so because we're more dialed into the real estate market, because we have a more sophisticated knowledge of uh, exactly what's going on, that's what's really going to allow us to um, find the find the gem in the rough, right? To find that needle in the haystack, which is the real opportunity that's hidden in the property that we're discussing with that private seller. So let's let's walk into a real life wholesaling example, just to kind of break things down for you guys. So this is a property we wholesaled uh, back in 2019, right near I think the end of 2019. Um, it was a duplex here in London, Ontario. You know, it had been neglected a bit. It was in a little bit rough shape. It was in a relatively unique location as well, which we'll get to. But first, I just want to share this with you guys. Um, so uh, it was a duplex. The upper was a two bed, one bath, currently being rented for $750 all inclusive. That was going to be vacant as of May 31st, 2020. Um, the potential rent could be $1,200. Um, once you know you got in there, you renovated, fixed it up to its highest best use. That's a massive value add as an investor. That that will dramatically uh, impact the value of the property, assuming that people are valuing the property based upon the income or cash flow that it's generating. And in markets in southwestern Ontario, it, we really are using the income based approach. Where you know in markets like Toronto, where there's a lot more fear and a lot more competition for the properties, sometimes it's literally just you know the greater fool principle, where people are just willing to pay a lot more money for that property. Um, then We've also on the main had a two bedroom, one bath that was currently being rented for six fifty all inclusive that had the opportunity that possibly you could get vacant as well. And again, that uh, fixed up and really adds highest best use could rent out for twelve hundred dollars. So there was an opportunity to nearly double the gross rents here if we could get in, renovate the property with those strategic renovations that you guys have heard me talk about on my YouTube channel in the past and previous videos. So there was also potential to uh, do a third unit, but the issue was the ceilings were below uh, six foot five. So here in Ontario, in most municipalities, if the uh, ceiling height isn't six foot five, you're not going to be able to have a legal rental unit. So again, you'd have to go in and figure out a way to renovate the property, maybe dig it out um, in order to get the additional height you needed. Uh, so you could, you know, underpin the foundation and uh, get another few inches or maybe add a foot or two. Again, it's not going to be a cheap process. And oftentimes we find sellers don't want to invest that sort of money in order to bring their property to the fullest, highest, best use. So otherwise, you can see here there was just some expenses broken down here on our sales sheet. Um, again, just in my opinion, nice, beautiful brick building had the little garage that was in kind of rough shape there at the back. And uh, then um, was side by side with a city lot. So here's the full breakdown. The way way this deal was found was a wholesaler, you know, driving for dollars or door knocking, whatever you want to call it. They were in this neighborhood. They saw a property that looked like it was being neglected, but still had some great potential, some great bones. They talked to the tenants and got the landlord's phone number. So this is a major mistake a lot of beginner wholesalers make where, you know, they say knock on a door to find out if the, if the owner's home and if they're interested in selling and they get a tenant. And they're like, oh, sorry, didn't mean to bother you. And they just move on. Now, a more sophisticated investor is going to talk to the tenant and be like, hey, I'm interested in buying this property. Would you be willing to give me the landlord's phone number? Sometimes it takes a little bit more nuance or finesse. Sometimes you need to explain, you know, yeah, I understand this is an unusual situation, but I am an investor. I'm actively looking to buy properties in this neighborhood. And this looks 
you know, like the perfect property for me, this looks like the perfect project. So I wondered if you were willing to give me the landlord's phone number. Uh, the owner uh, or the seller agreed to sell this property for 200,000 sale price for the duplex. Uh, the wholesaler found an investor willing to pay 210 for the property. So the wholesaler profited $10,000 on this assignment deal. Now, why would the owner want to sell to this wholesaler? Well, the property was kind of in a unique location. It was right beside railway tracks. So it's not particularly attractive to someone that wants to house hack or to, you know, a uh, just like a family buyer or a retail buyer, because there's oftentimes a lot of stigma with being right beside railway tracks. You know, people assume it's going to be a lot noisier. People assume that, you know, maybe there's going to be issues with people hanging around the property, things of that nature. Um, it was in rougher condition. So again, not necessarily perfect for a retail buyer that wanted a turnkey solution. They wished to sell the property, but their daughter was living there and wanted to remain a tenant for six months. So again, a unique situation that a lot of realtors won't want to deal with on the MLS. And then finally, they also wanted an easy process. So the seller lived out of town, but the wholesaler was willing to drive an hour to walk through the paperwork and get the document signed. Because again, the seller wasn't really interested in doing electronic signatures. They didn't want to do DocuSign. So again, problems are profits. In this case, the wholesaler was willing to go the extra mile in order to get the uh, in order to get the deal, in order to you know make it work for the seller. So this real life example, uh, or here's another real life example. So meet Shahir from my team of wholesalers. So there's Shahir pointing at the cash flow tribe video, and this is actually you know pretty much our the majority of our whole team other than Peter was the one taking the photo. Um, so right now, if you guys didn't know, I have about six full-time wholesalers working for me just in Southwestern Ontario alone. So you can absolutely do this. I'm also still doing the occasional wholesale deal on the side. And so in this case, Shahir from my team in his first 60 days as a wholesaler, he did a $20,000 assignment fee on one deal here in London, Ontario. Now, when he started, he knew absolutely nothing about real estate investing or wholesaling. He'd never made an offer, never negotiated on a deal, definitely had never bought a property before in his life. But he was very dedicated, he was very focused, and he was willing to put in the work in order to you know, get the results. And I'd like to think he had a pretty good mentor as well. But again, Shahir dropped out university. If you don't know his backstory, back in 2019, he literally dropped out of university, moved into the mansion with me and went all in on wholesaling real estate. So in London, Ontario, our average wholesale fee is about $15,000. So again, you know, that first example I showed you was a $10,000 wholesale fee. Shahir's first deal was a $20,000 wholesale fee in his first 60 days. So, you know, our typical deal ranges from 5,000 to 50,000 per property. Now, each market, each, each municipality or city is definitely unique. I know wholesalers in Toronto and Ottawa that are able to consistently do, you know, high five figures, high, sometimes even like six figures, sometimes mid six figures on their assignment fees. It's really going to depend upon the specific deal, what's going on in your market and just what the average sale price in a property is as well, right? So if a wholesaler is, you know, able to make five, 10% on the purchase sale price, well, if you're dealing in a market that regularly does a million dollars, well, that would be like 50,000 to 100,000 if we're talking five to 10%. Um, if you guys are interested in what our primary sources of leads are, they are door knocking and driving for dollars. That's absolutely a free process that anyone can get into. So you don't need a ton of money to do this. Um, you can network with other real estate investors. So again, often other real estate investors understand the win-win opportunity that a wholesaler can bring. You know, landlords don't want to, like a lot of landlords at least, don't want to disrupt their tenants. They don't want to go through the hassle of having a ton of tire kickers come through their property. And so they don't want to list it on the MLS. They don't want to put it on realtor.ca. They don't want to deal with the pain and headache because oftentimes when we list our property, our rental property on the MLS or realtor.ca, it can spook our tenants. Sometimes tenants want to move out and that can be scary for the existing landlord if all of a sudden it's going to put them in a cash crunch position where they're no longer getting that rental income. Sometimes it's just going to result in a bunch of complaints from the tenants. 
Some tenants are very difficult and go make the sale process very difficult as well. They'll maybe refuse to do showing. Sometimes they change their locks. Sometimes they just yell and scream at uh, potential buyers of the property. And uh, so again, that's where oftentimes when we're at those local real estate investing meetup groups, we're talking to landlords and asking, hey, have you been thinking about selling any properties? Because I'm interested in buying them. And we'll just chat with them and see if we can find a win-win opportunity there as well. You know, one of our favorite processes is flyer campaigns. So that's the handwritten uh, we buy houses flyers. Again, very simple, very effective. When we were first getting into it and we were a little bit, you know, scarcity oriented, we were kind of scared of spending money. We'd literally just print print off, you know, 100 flyers using our home printer. And I would pay like a local high school student to go door to door and just put flyers in mailboxes or knock on doors. Um, worked really well until it didn't. Uh, one day I got a call from a very frustrated property owner that was like, why did you put 500 flyers in my mailbox? And I was like, I apologize. I take responsibility for that. Um, you should have only got one flyer. So eventually we decided to move on to a more sophisticated process with our flyer campaigns and started using uh, precision targeting from Canada Post. So again, this can all be done through Canada Post if you want, or you can guerrilla market it by doing it yourself, door knocking. And if you're really tight on resources, but you've got a lot of time, you know, door knocking, driving for dollars, or like we were talking about earlier in this webinar, doing uh, Google Street View for dollars can be a great way to initially generate some leads or opportunities. Always be networking. Your network is your net worth. So you guys need to get out to more local REI meetup groups and just talk to more landlords. Um, there's a lot of baby boomers that got into real estate investing that, you know, their children grew up too close to the business. Their children grew up with their parents dragging them to rental properties to help them renovate or paint or unclog a toilet. And so the next generation, they have a bad stigma or a bad, uh, just a bad taste in their mouth in regards to rental real estate. So they have no interest in inheriting it or taking over the properties. So now, you know, as their parents are getting older, their parents are at the point where they want to pass it on. Again, this has been a big opportunity for myself because a lot of real estate investors, they remember being younger and hungrier. They remember having zero properties and being very scared and very concerned. And a lot of us enjoy paying it forward to someone else, you know, that is similar to us, someone else that has that same hunger, that same excitement towards the business, especially if your own children aren't interested in learning the business, they'll often want to take you under their wing. So you like you guys need to be doing more networking. And then of course, flyer campaigns um, are a big lead source for us as well. So let's reverse engineer that $5,000 per month or $60,000 per year by wholesaling real estate. It's actually not that difficult, guys. If we look at it, you know, all you need to do is take your yearly goal divided by your typical deal. And that's going to be the number of deals you're required to hit per year in order to hit that goal. And $60,000 is absolutely amazing. So here in my market in Southwestern Ontario in London, you know, our average deal is about $15,000. That's four deals per year. That means you need to do one deal every three months. Do you think that you could do one deal every three months? Does that feel possible? Does that feel achievable? Because it absolutely should. If Shahir can do it with zero experience in 60 days, absolutely anyone can do this if they've got the commitment, if they're focused, if they're constantly improving themselves, and, and finally, if they're willing to put in the hard work. This is simple, but not easy. That's what a lot of people confuse about real estate investing. You know, there's no silver bullet. It's not rocket science. It's definitely not brain surgery, but it's also not easy. It is hard work. You're going to have to put in work, especially if you're not experienced, especially if you haven't done this before. Um, because again, think about it, just like any skill set, you can't decide to be an NBA player or a hockey player um, overnight. You have to practice. You got to put in the work. You got to put in the reps. So the key to success as a real estate wholesaler is just taking that consistent action and focusing on the big picture and long-term goals and then reverse engineering the actions you require to achieve your goal and then break that goal into smaller milestones. The way you eat an elephant is a bite at a time. I'm going to need to figure out a better, uh, a better metaphor there because it seems weird having a vegan talking about eating a elephant. But when we're talking about reverse engineering our goals, I want to introduce you guys, if you haven't heard of it before, the 110-3-1 rule. So 
based upon our experiences for a competent investor or wholesaler, we find that a hundred real leads. And now there's a big difference between leads and real leads. And we can get into that in a second, but those hundred real leads should result in 10 viewings or offers. So what that looks like is those hundred real leads, you know, are distressed properties, are properties that look like they have a value add opportunity or are somehow being underutilized by their existing owner. Of those 10 viewings and offers that we're gonna make, it should result in three serious negotiations. So not every offer we make results in a deal, right? Not every offer we make results in a win-win. Sometimes, you know, we can't come to terms with the seller and that's all right. But it's important that we're constantly out there making those offers because if you guys want a secret in regards to real estate investing, if you make zero offers, I can guarantee you how many deals you're gonna get. Yeah, it's zero. So. In order to actually get those opportunities, you need to go out there, you need to start making more offers and you need to be negotiating on more properties. Of those three serious negotiations or opportunities, we should result in one deal. And again, if the average wholesale fee in your market, if the average opportunity is about $15,000, boom. That means if you're a competent investor or wholesaler, you probably just need to generate 100 leads, 100 real leads, over the next three months in order to get that one deal in order to hit your $5,000 a month milestone. But if you're new to this, then it's probably going to take a little bit more work. You're probably going to have a bit of a learning curve before you're going to be able to achieve the consistent results that say myself or my team or other more competent investors and wholesalers are able to do. So maybe you're going to have to take three or five times the amount of activity for your first deal. So be it. Isn't that still worth it? Isn't generating 500 real leads to get 50 viewings or 50 offers worth it if it means you're going to hit your $5,000 a month goal as a wholesaler? And then those 50 viewings or offers should result in 15 serious negotiations or opportunities. So again, of those 15 serious negotiation or opportunities, even if you're brand new to this, even if you're stumbling over your words, even if you're you know scared of your own shadow as an investor, that should still result in one deal. And so one example that I'd like to really highlight is a Cashflow Tribe member, um, Spencer. So Spencer's absolutely crushing in my opinion because he just decided to dive all into real estate investing. He didn't have a, really any experience beforehand. He'd worked as an entre entrepreneur before, but when he joined Cashflow Tribe, he was 19 years old. And in order to try and learn as fast as possible, he just made a commitment of, I'm just gonna make five offers a day. I don't have necessarily all the time and energy to go generate those private leads. So I'm just going to make five offers a day on the MLS. You know what happens when you make five offers a day on the MLS after 30 days? It means you've made 150 offers. Do you know what happens when you make 150 offers? You get a lot of experience as a real estate investor. In fact, if I had to guess, I bet your average kind of, you know, wannabe real estate investor won't even make 150 offers over a decade. Let that sink in. Spencer Dam, the 19 year old, he's able to make 150 offers a month. He's in my mind compressing time so much that he's getting 10 years of experience in one month. Now, again, even if that doesn't hit, he understands that this is achievable, this is doable. So he might have to reach out. He may have to network with more investors. He might have to change his approach. He may have to start looking off the MLS but he's really gaining that experience over a short period of time so that he can get to that point of hitting his $5,000 a month as a wholesaler. So next steps in homework. So for my Cashflow Tribe Alpha members in particular, if you guys are interested in becoming a wholesaler, if you're interested in making $5,000 a month as a real estate investor, this is what I want you guys to do. Even those of you at home, you can play along as well if you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook. What I want you to do is research your market and become competent at determining the after repair value of properties. If you're not sure what the after repair value of a property is or what that term means, well, in Cashflow Tribe Alpha, we've actually got an entire hour of training where I broke down how to calculate ARV. We also talked about things like a comp realtor and that training's all available for you guys in Cashflow Tribe Alpha. If you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook, you guys, there's a link in the video description down below. You can join Cashflow Tribe Alpha, get a free 14 day trial. You can binge all the content I've put together there, all the content Ben and myself have poured in into Cashflow Tribe. You can binge it for 13 or 14 days, cancel on the 14th day and pay nothing. 
no harm, no foul, but we trust that we're providing so much value with this training, especially now that we're moving to daily live trainings. So again, reminder, every weekday of March, I'm going to be doing a live training or someone else from the cash flow tribe uh, team is going to be doing live trading at 7 30 PM Eastern standard time. It's going to be roughly a 45 minute lecture. I know this one's going a little bit long followed by a 15 minute Q and a. So those of you that have been patiently watching this and holding back your questions, I'm about to get to your questions. I just need to wrap up this one slide. So then after that, uh, once you guys have gotten competent at determining the after repair value, once you've, figured out how to get a comp realtor on your team, what I want you to do is complete and review the contract paperwork. So that's the purchase and sale agreement. That's the tactical guide that's available to you in alpha training, as well as complete the paperwork training that Ben did. So Ben actually put together an entire mini course just focused on walking you through the paperwork for Ontario real estate investors. Now, if you're not in Ontario or you're not part of Cashflow Drive Alpha, you can still figure out what your paperwork is just look at a purchase and sale agreement. Talk to a realtor, talk to a lawyer, talk to a real estate investor, get your hands on that contract and just read it through. I know at first seeing you know a six and eight, a 10 page written legal document can be extremely intimidating, but I promise you it actually is written in English. All you need to do is just take your time, sit down, read through it. If you don't understand it the first time, read through it a second time. It's really important you get used to using these tools. You know, you wouldn't want to go to war without knowing how to use a gun. You don't want to go into real estate negotiations without understanding the paperwork. So again, for Cashflow Tribe Alpha members, all that training is available in the course portal for you guys. Then finally, research the competition. So sign up for all the local wholesaler email lists in your market. See what sort of deals they're getting. See what deals sell fast. See what deals sell slow. Get a firm understanding of what's going on in your market, as well as review, you know, Kijiji, Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace for those We Buy Houses ads and dive into exactly what their value proposition is. And then figure out, can you make a similar value proposition as an aspiring wholesaler? Once you've completed the following for Cashflow Tribe Alpha members, what I want you guys to do is jump into that uh, Cashflow Tribe Alpha private Facebook group and tag myself, Adam, Mike, and Shahir from my team, tag all four of us once you've done everything I listed out on this homework. And one of us will just jump on a phone call with you guys. We'll chat with you 10, 15, 30 minutes if you impress us. And we'll answer any additional questions you guys got about wholesaling. We're really committed to making sure that our Cashflow Tribe Alpha members level up with us. We're all about win-wins, guys, because as I continue to train more wholesalers, as I continue to help more real estate investors get control of their personal financial journeys, I get more opportunities. As you guys start going out there, you know, stirring up deals, you're going to come across a 50 unit apartment building and have no idea what to do. Well, that's when you reach out to Matt and maybe I'm going to buy that 50 unit apartment building and I'll pay you an assignment fee. I'm more than happy to make someone money if they're helping me make money as well. It, there really is more than enough money in this world for us to all make it, guys. That's not just a catchy catchphrase that I say on my YouTube channel. So I think the Cashflow Tribe team actually put together a special little uh, video for us. So I'm just going to pull it up. We'll watch this uh, this little video about Cashflow Tribe, and then I'm going to jump into your question. So if you're watching this on Easy Webinar, if you're watching this on Facebook, if you're watching this on YouTube, jump into that comment section, start hitting me up with your questions. And for the next at least 15 minutes, I'm more than happy to answer them. All right, so uh, I'm not sure if that video was supposed to have sound. I couldn't hear the sound, so apologize for that, guys. I see a bunch of you want to see what all the homework was, so I'm going to pull that up again. But otherwise, whoop, whoop. okay. Otherwise, uh, jump in with your questions, and I'll start. Uh, 
get an end to them. So here, let's get back to that last slide. Boom. So there's the homework for the cash flow tribe alpha members that want to get their uh, free training with me. I'm more than happy to, uh, or a free phone call with me. Otherwise, let's see what's going on on YouTube. Awesome. Love the comments, guys. Oh, man. Thank, thank you, Greg, from Top 5 Best. Appreciate the $5 contribution. That means a lot to me. Um, need to get Mike Nowicki in a video talking about this. Absolutely. We'll get Mike in the future. Hey, Matt, love the videos. I have about 50000 saved. I'm looking to change careers and get into real estate investing. Do you recommend getting my real estate license as well? So that's a great question. Um, and it kind of ties into wholesaling as well. So if you're in Ontario, Canada, you're really going to want to be a wholesaler and a uh, you know, a private buyer of properties, or you're going to want to be a realtor. Uh, you can't be a wholesaler and a realtor at the same time. It's a conflict. You will get in trouble with Rico. So it's definitely important that you understand what your long-term goals are. I think you can absolutely be a real estate investor and a realtor, but you just can't be a real estate investor, a realtor, and a wholesaler at the same time. So, you know, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, if you want to help other people, you know, and you want to like be brokering deals, then you absolutely want to become a real estate agent. If you want to be a private investor and sometimes, you know, get great opportunities or get deals under contract, well, then I think wholesaling is probably a better fit. Um, so any advice or insights for con Canadians considering purchasing in Florida, primarily for family vacation use, but also for rental? Uh, so I don't have a lot of experience with, uh, you know, U.S. properties um, in general. You know, there's a few things to be aware of. If you own over $100,000 in foreign assets, there are certain different disclosures you're going to have to make as a Canadian. So, you know, be aware of that. But realistically, if you want to be investing out of country, I really recommend sitting down and talking with an expert. Talk to your uh, your accountant. Talk to, uh, you know, your lawyer, your your legal, all that good stuff, and really make sure that you understand what's going on. Um, I want to aim as big as I can, fourplex if possible. I live in Calgary and have 50G saved. Do I need to save more? I hate my current job, by the way. Need an out real bad, LOL. Um, hey, Ryan. Yeah, uh, I definitely understand that, that desire. So this is a very broad question. The thing is, a lot of real estate investors struggle from not having a goal. So that's really the big issue here. So you need to really figure out what your long-term goal is. I'm going to guess if you hate your day job, it's going to be quitting that day job. So if you want to quit your day job, first, you need to figure out what sort of income do you need to replace? What, what are your basic needs? What's your minimum you know, livable amount? And then start reverse engineering from there. Uh, Will asks, is it possible to get a mortgage for a rental property if I have more than enough for the down payment but no recorded income? Uh, so, Will, you're not probably going to be able to get traditional bank financing, but absolutely with uh, private financing, you can do that. Um, so, you know, you're going to want to look at alternative lenders. You're going to want to talk to credit unions. You're going to want to talk to mortgage agents and mortgage brokers, as well as talk to private investors and just private individuals that also, you know, lend out on real estate opportunities. How do you line up before your buyer for the exit strategy? What's the time between your average buy and sell? So yeah, this is important. Uh, great question, Ryan. So in th there's a few different approaches here as a real estate investor and a wholesaler that we should probably distinguish. So obviously in the course of an hour, I can't cover everything in regards to wholesaling real estate. This is just the tip of the iceberg, but I really hope it helps inspire you guys to do more research and to then once you've got a little bit more research and understanding under your belt, go out there and take action. So you know, our typical process for assigning the deal is going to be anywhere from one to kind of 15 days in general. Sometimes it takes longer. Uh, as the wholesaler, and it depends on what market you're in, here in Ontario, Canada, you're going to want to be able to close on the deal if you aren't going to sign it, or you're going to want to have a JV partner that's willing to close on the deal with you. That's why a lot of, uh, or that's why like my entire wholesale team, that's why they choose to team up with me is because I'm that real estate investor that has the capital and experience that if we're not able to assign a deal, I can always go in there and close it uh, myself. Um, alternatively, or like in addition to that, at the same time, you can tie up a property under contract and continue to do your due diligence. And if for whatever reason, you know, you find out something about the property that makes it no longer a deal or doesn't fit the business model you're planning on implementing, well, then you can use that exit or escape clause. Um, so for example, sometimes, we don't know what the exact use or zoning or if there's a uh, um, 
uh, non-conforming allowance on the property that would allow us to, you know, be outside of the zoning. So we'll need to take some time to call the city to do our research. And sometimes we do that research and we realize, oh, no, this is definitely a legal use. The seller told us it was legal, but now that we've dived into it, it doesn't work anymore on our business model. So we're going to drop the deal. Um, Zach's asking, did you go to college and was it worth it? Have you benefited from it? So I did go to university. Uh, I went to the University of Guelph Humber here in uh, Ontario. Um, I went through to become a CPA. So I got my chartered accountant license. Uh, for me, it was a very valuable experience. I definitely, it gave me a lot of financial understanding and background and certainly also sparked my interest in real estate investing. So one thing I noticed when I was doing the taxes for some of our higher net worth clients as an accountant um, or a tax preparer, you know, I realized, man, a lot of these successful business people are also investing in real estate. A lot of these people have holding companies that own a lot of real estate. I think they probably know something I don't. So that that inspired me and probably led me down the journey that got me here today. So absolutely, I think that university and college can be a great investment, but it can also be a terrible investment. It's very much a personal decision and really depends on what your long term goals are, Zach. So I hope that helps. Um, do do do. Can I represent the buyer when I do a wholesale deal as a real estate agent? So uh, dream for pro uh, depends on what exact you know jurisdiction you're in. But here in Ontario, Canada, you can't be wholesaling a deal and a real estate agent. It's going to be a conflict. It's going to get really messy and you're going to get some RICO complaints. Um, so it's definitely different depending on you know your jurisdiction. There could be markets in Canada or the US where you can absolutely wholesale a deal as a realtor. You're just going to have to look look into your local laws. Um, thoughts on the Calgary market? I don't know a lot about the Calgary market. Uh, I hear, you know, it's a little bit uh, tumultuous right now. You know, it, it's uh, not at a peak for sure. It The thing about Alberta in general, and particularly, you know, the markets that are driven by oil prices is it's a boom bust cycle. And so you need to understand that as an investor, you need to prepare for that because you're going to go through periods of huge upswings when oil is uh, going through the roof and you potentially are going to go through huge downswings when uh, oil is dropping in price and employers are contracting their uh, labor pool. So really just important to be dialed in and build that into your business model. But that being said, you can absolutely make money in any real estate market. It's just a matter of uh, having the right business plan for the right market. For the Burr method, do you recommend an FHA loan, then refinance to a conventional loan? So Daily Grind, uh, I'm a Canadian, so we don't have FHA loans. Uh, it, my understanding is, you know, U.S. investors do structure it that way. Um, some just go with a traditional financing on their Burr. Uh, you'll just have to figure out exactly what you're trying to accomplish as an investor and what mortgage products best fit your business model. How do you recommend getting started as a real estate wholesaler in Ontario and working with a team to learn as you go? Uh, networking game of millions. It's absolutely about networking. So go out to some local REI meetup groups. If you're here in London, Ontario, I recommend checking out Onria. Uh, my, uh, my buddy, Sean Allen and uh, his wife, Jen, they run it and uh, do a fantastic job. We, myself and Jeff Weibel also support them there. If you guys are in the GTA, check out Right Club. If you're in Windsor, check out Wind City. If you're in Ottawa, I've heard great things about Oreo, uh, that group. If you're in the Durham, Oshawa, Pickering area, go check out the Durham REI meetup group. Also, if you're in Toronto, check out the Rise Network. Uh, shout out to Austin and Daniel for starting out that meetup group. Um, so yeah, as long as you blank you, as long as you're blatant and straightforward about what you're doing, and depending on your brokerage, I heard it's okay. I watched multiple YouTube videos. Hey, dream for pro if that's true go ahead and do it. Uh, I would just, I want to use more than just YouTube videos in order to determine if what I'm doing is legal. So I'd want to talk to a real estate, your broker of license, if you're a real estate agent and just make sure, or broker of record, I should say, if you're a real estate agent to make sure uh, you're on the right side of the law there. How do you accurately estimate after repair value? How do you get your comps without being a realtor? So Harriet Tubman, um, probably not your real name, but if you are part of Cashflow Tribe, I've got a one hour training exactly breaking that down for you. If you're not an Alpha Cashflow Tribe member, well, there's a link in the video description down below where you can join for absolutely free for 14 days. If you decide it's not for you, you can just drop your membership for the first 14 days. You won't get charged. No harm, no foul. And uh, you won't upset me or hurt my feelings. 
Um, Rudy's asking here on easy webinar, what would be the nominal number of days before the purchase and sale agreement would become void? Is there a minimum and max? So there really is no minimum and max. Now that being said, there's definitely industry standards. So in general, you're probably going to be looking at anywhere from five to 15, maybe 30 days during your condition period, but it's really whatever you and the seller negotiate. Um, now, that being said, if you guys are looking for a couple of little pro tips, one of the things we like to do rather than saying, you know, um, if I don't uh, waive conditions by March 7th, this offer is null and void, or if I don't waive offers within five days, this offer is null and void, um, we'll do five business days. Buys you a little bit of time, especially if you can structure around a weekend. So that can be a great way just to stretch just a little bit more um, into your time period in order to uh, sign the deal. Uh, but again, like you, if, if it's a, truly a deal, if you're excited to invest in it or one of your JV partners is, you can always go firm on the deal. And then if it doesn't assign, you just close on it yourself, right? And that, that really long term as a wholesaler is going to be the best business model that you can implement. Um, is the seller signing an exclusive PSA? So is the seller signing an exclusive purchase and sale agreement? Uh, so, you know, if they're entering into a purchase and sale agreement with you, unless there's some really interesting verbiage in it, it will be exclusive. You'll have the sole right to buy and close on the property it, during your condition period. If you don't waive conditions, then you'll be exiting the deal. Now, the seller can always enter into a backup offer, and that's a little bit more of an advanced strategy. And we can definitely do a full, you know, training on more advanced conditions and things of that nature. If you guys are part of Cashflow Tribe Alpha, uh, if you dive into our tactical guide on our top 10 favorite clauses, you'll actually see a backup offer clause right there or a breakdown and an explanation, at least, of what a backup offer is. Um, Tom's asking, would you set up a company before you purchase your first property to take advantage of tax purposes? So, Tom, I personally wouldn't. Um, I find way too often, uh, you know, beginner investors are putting the cart before the horse. They're getting all worked up about taxes and getting the perfect corporate structure. And to me, that's really a red herring. A lot of people use to distract themselves from just getting in there and doing a deal. Um, a lot of the accountants I know will buy in their personal name until they can't. And then they'll set up a corporation. Um, obviously, if if you're not, you know, a sophisticated investor capable of making that decision, I recommend just sitting down with your accountant and a lawyer, getting their perspective as well as networking with other real estate investors and finding out exactly what, what they think is best. And it's obviously very personal. So if you know that you're going to go out there and be the next Grant Cardone and get 100,000 units eventually, well, then, yeah, you're probably going to want a corporate structure. But if you're brand new and you're not even sure if real estate investing is right for you, I don't necessarily see the need to spend the extra money to set up a corporation and jump through all those extra hoops because it's also going to add on additional costs um, as f like additional legal and accounting costs because both your accountant and lawyer is going to charge you more to set up that corporation and continue to operate it. Um, beyond that, uh, again, the tax purposes, like depending on exactly where you are, if you're in, in Canada, you know, there may not be the same tax benefits that you're currently thinking there is because odds are uh, your real estate investment in a uh, company is going to be considered not to be active um, because you're probably not employing five or more full time employees, which could put you at the highest tax bracket rather than the lowest tax bracket. Uh, so, again, very nuanced uh, situation that you're just going to need to get dialed in on. Um, Andre is asking, how do you determine if an off-market deal is a good deal? Do you use calculations such as uh, 0.75 of the ARV renovations? Great question. Um, so yeah, so when we're trying to determine if a, if a deal is a good deal, it, it's obviously very personal. So each investor is going to have their own perspective. Uh, one of my buddies, Sean Allen, who's been on my YouTube channel in the past, he's one of Canada's biggest flippers. If not, he easily could be the biggest flipper. Um, no one really keeps track of those stats. So I'm going to keep saying he's the biggest flipper until someone corrects me. Uh, but Sean, you know, he's very focused. His business model is kind of made around. He wants to make sure he's going to make at least $30,000 off of a deal in order for it to make sense based upon his business model. So for Sean, it's all about, will I make $30,000 after I pay everyone after everything gets done? Because that's going to compensate him appropriately for the amount of risk and reward he's taking on. Now, if it's a bigger, more complex project, he's going to want to make more than $30,000. So that 75% of the ARV um, after renovations is really just a, a rule of thumb. And like any rule of thumb, it's a good indicator whether something's a deal. 
But once we start really getting into specifics on an opportunity, it, you know, we need to really dial into what's your business model? What are you trying to accomplish? Or alternatively, if you're a wholesaler, you know, what are investors in your market trying to accomplish? Um, so I think I've caught up on most of my questions on cash flow drive alpha. So that's fantastic. I'll jump over to YouTube real quick. See if you guys got a few more amazing to see 71 of you watching this on YouTube and, uh, or I guess it's YouTube and Facebook and amazing to see that, uh, 25 of you are hanging out with me on cash flow drive alpha as well. Um, Hey, I've saved 30,000 in my bank and want to buy a property and rent it. How should I start? Muhammad, you should join Cashflow Tribe Alpha, or you should watch the 600 videos I've done for free on my YouTube channel. I'd start at either one or do both. Um, again, it's one of those things where it, what do you want to accomplish as a real estate investor, right? That's the biggest question we need to be asking ourselves. Um, so yeah, all right. Uh, I'll do one more. Do you agree that most MLS listings are bid up too high to be viable investments? Uh, yes, I, I think that most properties on the MLS are targeting retail buyers and investors are not retail buyers. So unless you're looking for a turnkey solution as an investor, uh, the best opportunities probably aren't on the MLS. Now, does that mean that there's no deals on the MLS? Absolutely not. Um, you know, I'd be it'd be misleading for me to say that. So. I think you can absolutely do deals on the MLS right now. I'm, you know, buying a 31 unit apartment building that was on the MLS. Um, I wholesaled a deal that was on the MLS earlier this year. So of the properties and deals that I'm doing, we're maybe doing, I don't know, 20% of our deals on the MLS. The, re the rest of the 80% are private deals. And again, the biggest reason isn't necessarily just the price. It's also the terms. So it's way easy, easier to get a vendor take back mortgage or get, you know, more creative terms on a purchase and sale agreement without realtors. Because think about it. what happens is you've got you, the buyer, then you've got your realtor, then you've got their realtor, then you've got the seller. How many opportunities are there for that broken telephone game versus when you're the buyer and they're the seller and you guys are talking to direct? You can much better understand their why, what they're really trying to accomplish, and you can better craft your your uh, offer to both fit your needs, which you already know, as well as the seller's needs. So for me, that's really the reason that I love doing private deals is it gives me so much more opportunity to get creative and create those win-win opportunities with everyone. Um, <laughs> laugh out loud. He seems to not want to even mention that real estate is a bad idea right now. Very sad. Okay, it turns out that Hippie Mippy apparently is a greater real or a much more sophisticated investor than myself because they believe that real estate is a bad deal. <laughs> okay, I mean, like, what does that even mean? Are you telling me that there's no opportunities in real estate investing? I'm pretty sure that you can make money in any real estate market. Now, do I want to tell people to go buy pre construction condos in Toronto and drop $600,000? No. No, I don't really want to do that. Do I want to see you guys paying a thousand dollars a square foot for a property? No, but if you can get a cash flowing rental property in Southwestern Ontario, let's let's get real here, hippie. I'm going to hit you hard with some facts rather than just your arbitrary feelings and emotions. Let's let's focus on the data and not the drama. So focusing on the data, minimum wage here in Ontario, Canada, fifteen bucks an hour. If someone's working full time at minimum wage, they're making thirty thousand dollars a year. Stats Canada tells us the average Canadian spend about 30, 40% of their income on shelter. Well, if they're making $30,000 a year, that means they can spend about 10, 12,000, maybe even $14,000 a year on shelter. Okay, cool. That means they can afford about $1,000 a month in rent as a minimum wage employee. Here in London, Ontario, if I'm renting out a one bedroom apartment for about 1,000 bucks a month, that sounds like a very sustainable cash flow proposition. If I'm cash flowing $200 a month per unit at current interest rates, sounds like a very good deal to me. But I'd love to hear what facts you got, hippie. All right. That was fun. Um, so always fun to, you know, smack someone down in the comment section. So <laughs> we're worried about the coronavirus. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. If you want to get all worked up about some drama, go ahead and do it. Um, maybe it's the end of the world and life as we know it will never be the same. If it's a black swan event, it's a black swan event. If everyone's going to lose everything, I'd rather have a lot and lose it than have nothing and lose it. Does that make sense, guys? All right. Well, this was a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to doing a live video every day this week on YouTube. And we'll get off to a better start tomorrow. I promise you guys.
Sorry about the rough start for the YouTube and Facebook audience. This is my first time using this platform and really integrating it. Seems like a lot of fun though. I'm definitely enjoying it. So, you know, maybe this will become a reoccurring feature, but for now, just really appreciate everyone's support. It means a lot to me, um, especially the Cashflow Tribe members. And uh, I see Roberto just threw in a uh, Cashflow Tribe Council hook. So if you guys didn't know, as part of Cashflow Tribe, we got this thing. One, two, three, Cashflow Tribe. Huh. That, that's our little thing. All right. So if you guys weren't watching what we did this weekend, we had an amazing experience with a uh, boot camp event. It was really a one of a kind experience. I'm so proud of what we're doing with Cashflow Tribe. I personally think that this could easily be the greatest part of my legacy. Let me just see if, ooh, we actually do got a little boot camp commercial. So we've got one coming up again in the GTA, location to be determined, but it's gonna be March 28th and 29th, I believe. And let's just share this little video. Man, that video gets me amped. All right. Well, thanks again to everyone that watched this live stream. Reminder, we'll be going live again tomorrow, 730 Eastern Standard Time on uh, Easy Webinar on Facebook as well as YouTube. And we're going to be doing it every day this week. So I'm really excited to be doing that. Really appreciate everyone's support. So we're going to wrap up the YouTube live here, but really appreciate it, guys. And uh, hope you guys enjoyed that. Oh, and let's just do it one more time. There's more than enough money in this world for us to all make it, but if you guys aren't saving it, I mean, like, what's the point? Thanks, guys.